I mix the word complex Hadamard matrix with some words from physics, uncertainty, incompatibility, and non-classicality. And uh, I will try to, to make the links clear, clear. And let me just start with a little bit of introduction. Uh, you all know, uh, even if you're not physicists, that there are two theories in physics. One is classical physics and the other is quantum physics. And these things are not different, not, not the same, <laughs> they're different. And uh, the, one of the ongoing debates and questions is how are they different? And this of course goes back to the roots of quantum mechanics and foundations of quantum mechanics and quantum physics, but it has uh, known a revival since the 1980s, thanks to the uh, emergence of quantum information theory and more generally quantum technology, which made this somehow into a field that that um, that had a practical import. And so uh, I wrote some of the questions that people ask on there. I, I, I guess you read them while I was talking. Um, you see there's questions uh, of different kinds uh, because some of them pertain to the foundations and the other two applications. When I say how to harness the difference, that means how can you use this difference, right? So now uh, if you take 100 physicists and you give them each the chance to write down three key words uh, that uh, exemplify the difference between quantum and classical mechanics, you will find these words. I think you will find mostly these words, 90% of the words that will come up will be or summarized here. I think. Have you mentioned the test? No, <laughs> but nobody has ever told me that this was not true. And I think you can add to the list if you wish, we can discuss afterwards. I think the list is pretty complete. And actually, it's on there somewhere. The word coherent is on there. But coherence is not, but the word coherent is in there. So, um, and I colored in uh, purple the words that were in my title. Okay, so uh, I, I will try to explain to you how these three words link up with Hadamard matrix. So uh, before going though, I, I like, uh, yeah, so first of all, uh, if you end up being intrigued by my talk, you can go read a paper I published last year or a preprint that I will be happy to send to you. In uh, it's, it's basically finished, but I have to still put it on the archive. And so before starting, I like this a lot here, this quote of Henri Poincaré, as I said, there is two ways to be, two reasons to be interested in this whole business. One is because you like science and you like fundamental questions, and the other is because you want to build the better quantum mousetrap. Right? And uh, the, I think that the way uh, Henri Poincaré put it uh, some hundred years ago is actually beautiful because it reconciles everyone. So he says, I do not say science is useful because it helps us build machines. I say machines are useful because they free time to do science. So, okay, so now let's get started. So the entire talk will deal with only two ingredients. One is a complex Hilbert space of finite dimension. Now, physicists call this a Hilbert space, mathematicians call this a, uh, a Hermitian space because it's finite dimensional and it must be, is it 11 o'clock? Yes. I know, 12 o'clock. So, um, so I call this a Hilbert space, although it's finite dimension, it's just a, 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 a Hermitian space. And it is equipped with some extra structure, we heard about that earlier, which are two bases, which I call A and B. And so these bases have uh, each B basis vectors. And of course, then you can construct the transition matrix U, and you can get uh, what I call, oops, the A and the B representations, which are just the obvious, a uh, unitary that maps H into CD by using the components on the base, okay? So the entire talk deals with one Hilbert space of finite dimension and two bases, nothing else. Okay, good. So now the, the nice thing, uh, when I say a vector, I didn't write it down, which will always be normalized to one. So I'm not really looking at the Hilbert space. I'm looking at the unit sphere in the Hilbert space. And actually I look at the projective Hilbert space because I look, I'm interested in the projectors, but that, that's just a detail. And so once you do that, you have two probability distributions on the, on the, in, on the interval of integers one to D, okay? So this is just mathematics. This is a, a trivial mathematics. So, um, so the, this, is, this is the only ingredients I will be using. And so here are some examples. Well, no, you can do this equivalently by taking H to be CD and take U to be unitary. And then you can take for A the canonical basis, a B the columns of, 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 a, of U which is the same thing. But for reasons that I know why, I prefer to think this way. 
But if you're used to just thinking about unitary matrices, that's just the same thing. Okay. And now let me give you some examples. Uh, how come can A and B show up? They can show up because you have two self-adjoint operators, meaning two self-adjoint, yeah, two self-adjoint operators on your Hilbert space, which each have a canonical basis, and then you have two bases. They say, okay, well, okay, fine. When does this show up? For example, in representation theory. If you have the representation of SU2, for example, they're of dimension 2S plus one, for each there's a unique one, and then you can take uh, for A the basis of the generator of rotations around the Z along the around the Z axis, and for B rotations around the X axis. And I'm saying this example because it shows you're not really in CD; you're really in an abstract Hilbert space, in which you take uh, two bases determined by your representation. The other thing to do is to take your favorite unitary matrix, which could be the discrete Fourier transform or some other Hadamard matrix, matrix, or you could have just any unitary matrix with zeros in it. Not only zeros, of course, but with also zeros in it. So this is the setting. Now, the first thing I will look at, there were three words, uncertainty, incompatibility, non-classicality. Let's start with uncertainty. Okay. So once you have this uh, setting, you can define the A uncertainty of the vector psi, which is just the number of non-zero basis uh, L, uh, co coefficients on the basis A. And the same for B. So you have a vector in CD, which you constructed from your abstract sector vector psi, and it has some zero coefficients and some non-zero. You count the non-zero ones, you call it NA. I call this the A support of psi. Then I have the B support of psi, and, and now I can make a little picture. I, this is the A axis, the NA axis, and the NB axis. And where there is a, 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 a dot, the color coding I will explain later. When there is a dot, it means there exists a state psi which has this value for NA and that value for NB. And so there's three examples. This is spin one, dimension is three. This is the example I quickly uh, alluded to a second ago. This is actually the, 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 an arbitrary uh, MUB, mutually unbiased basis in dimension six, including the DFT. And this is the DFT in dimension seven. Let's look at them. Okay. Again, ignore the color and say, well, what does this look like? I call this uh, the uncertainty diagram of, of DFT, the uncertainty graph the diagram of this guy, etc. So these I call uncertainty diagrams. And you can ask, ask the question, given a matrix, what, do the, what does it look like? You can see some differences here. First of all, there is a very old little uh, result by Donahoe and Stark, which uh, I call the support uncertainty relation, which says this. It says that the product of these two things is bigger than one over MAB squared, where MAB is the maximum matrix element of the matrix U. This is uh, useless information if M is one, but that's not interesting anyway, if M is one, then uh, the, the, the one of the basis vectors of A is equal to one of the ones of B. So you should rule that out. Otherwise, this is some information. And this information is drawn here as this hyperbola. And, and so you can see that here in this example, this is not such a bad, uh, bad bound because it, uh, it is reached twice. Here it's not so bad because it's almost reached. And here it looks pretty bad because it's, well, it's reached up there and up there, but there is this entire soft belly there where there is nothing. So it looks like it's not a very good estimate. It's a lower bound, but maybe it's not so great. So why do I call this uncertainty? I hope you, you figure that out. Uh, uh, somehow, uh, when there are many zeros, your probability distribution is very concentrated. When there is few, uh, it is uh, flattened out, right? So, so th this gives you an idea of the joint uncertainty between these two uh, distributions. Okay, so uh, here's a theorem that helps to start, start starts to help explain uh, these these uh, these pictures. So the theorem says what? Um, wait a moment. I don't have a definition here. Ah, this is bad. I thought I had. Ah, no, the definition is here. Okay. Uh, the definition of the uncertainty diagram is there. I said what it was in words. It's those points for which there is a psi which reaches it. Okay, that's the uncertainty diagram, unc D. So the theorem says that this uncertainty diagram, the following three things are equivalent. 
either the uncertainty diagram is contained in the region above, above the uh, diagonal straight line Na plus Nb equal D plus one. This says that it is equal to that region. And this says that the transition matrix has no vanishing minors. Where is, uh, over, there. over there. You see why this is what I alluded to. So saying that the picture looks like this, which means that the uncertainty diagram lies, lies above this line, above or on this line, is equivalent to saying, no, is equivalent to saying that the transition matrix has no vanishing minors. Okay. And then there's a fourth point, which is a bit more, it looks a little messy, but that captures the idea of incompatibility. And I will not insist right now because I think I will run out of time, but this is for the people who know what incompatibility means. It says, I wrote it down here, I think, it says that a measurement in the B basis, following one in the A basis, will always perturb the result of the first measurement. This is written here. It says something about, I introduced these projectors, and it says something about these the corresponding spaces being uh, 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 intersecting trivial. Okay, so now I, I talked about uncertainty. I introduced incompatibility, and and and, and that's where we are. So uh, I now have a definition of completely incompatible. And for those who feel uncomfortable with the word incompatible, they just have to take this as a definition. A matrix U is incom completely incompatible if all its minors are non-vanishing. Period. And it need not be uh, a Hadamard matrix at this point. Okay, if it does that, then that means that if you draw the uncertainty diagram, it will look like that. Okay, so okay, so I think I don't know really much how much time I have. Um, Ten minutes. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so let me do that. So this is a, a version of incompatibility, which is a little hard to read if you don't have some experience with it. But this is a theorem that says that this thing implies a, no, a number of other things. Uh, uh, basically, uh, you always have that one implies two implies three implies four. Uh, and, and in two, you recognize the usual thing of incompatibility it has something to do with things not commuting. So I'm saying that this strong version of incompatibility implies that none of these projectors uh, commute. And now you can start to feel what's going on, because if I take two observables in the usual language, that means I take two self-adjoint operators, then I would say that they are not, uh, that they are incompatible if they don't commute. But for two self-adjoint operators not to commute, it suffices that two of their spectral projectors don't commute. So that, is, that, that means there exist two spectral projectors that do not commute. It's a very weak condition. It's very easy to be incompatible because it is very hard to be compatible. We know that from daily life and from international politics, right? So, so, uh, so, but, so this statement is much, much stronger because it says that none of these projectors is allowed to commute. And, and this is not even, the, and one is even stronger than that. Okay, so that's, so, and for example, uh, that MAB here, the minimum of the, of the matrix elements is positive. It's a very weak version of incompatibility. And of course, Hadamard matrices do that because they're all equal to one over square root of D. So, so I already anticipate here, it, is, it will be clear that not all Hadamard matrices are completely incompatible. Okay. Okay. So, so I talked about uncertainty, which is captured in these diagrams. You just have this diagram in your in your head. I talked about incompatibility, and now uh, let's look at um, uh, some some theorems and results. First thing you could say is, okay, this is fine. He has these he has introduced these uh, completely incompatible bases, which are things uh, which may not exist because I haven't really shown any except that I show one diagram where. Now here's a nice little theorem by Tao. He says that the discrete Fourier transform is completely incompatible of, uh, if and only if D is prime. It's a paper that probably many of you know. Of course, he doesn't use the word completely incompatible, but he proved this picture. And of course, the picture is not in his paper either, but, but that's what he had in mind. He said, we know this is true 
And I want to prove that, namely that Na plus Nb is always bigger or equal than D plus one. And he proved this for the discrete Fourier transform in uh, prime dimension and proved also it wasn't true in any other dimension. You can say that here in dimension six, it's not true. No, this is not right. No, this is not right. Uh, no, no, this is not right here. Uh, uh, this is not the one I want to show, or, or is it? No, no, there's some, this is another one. But here, let's just look at this. I'll come back later. Um, so uh, we're right here. Uh, does that, that's a result of, uh, of, uh, of Tao. Now, it's easy to check by hand and it measures two, three, and five. All Hadamars are uh, completely incompatible. You can imagine that's not very hard to do because there aren't very many of them around. You just check. Yeah, yeah, so it's easy, completely easy. Yes. Um, uh, yes, indeed, uh, there are no others. Yes, right. Uh, in dimension four, no Hadamar is completely incompatible. In dimension four, we have a list, it's not very long, it's just one parameter. You check them and they're, uh, they're not. What we don't know, so these are two questions uh, that maybe some of you are willing to think about. And it's very, I was happy with the talk of Professor Graydon before because it's the same kind of uh, uh, of approach. I'm proposing some questions that maybe somebody can answer. Um, the question is, in which dimensions do there exist Hadamard matrix that are completely incompatible? Of course, we know in the prime dimensions they exist because we have the discrete Fourier transform. Right? We know in dimension four they don't exist. So, we, we know, so, so what happens in, in other dimensions? And then the next question is again, very similar to questions asked before, in which dimensions are all Hadamard uh, matrices completely incompatible? And as you just point out in two, three and five, this is true. In seven, I personally do not know if there are other Hadamard matrices than the Fourier transform. It's just that I don't, there are. Okay, so then there is already something to ask. And in dimension six also, it's not clear what's happening. Okay, so, so this is, uh, the question is really, um, it's, yes. No, 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 this, this result you mean? No, it only deals with Fourier. This is specifically a Fourier uh, statement. But yes, yes, but I can ask you some, some questions that maybe are not so easy. I'll come to that. But this statement once uh, is proven by Tao uh, with some number theory. I can come, I, I can tell you something more about that if possibly later. But uh, uh, indeed, the hard part is, is, is the prime part. Yes, yes, right. So uh, let me just say this. So the question is, you want uh, to know when your diagram will look like that. That's the question. So you take your favorite, um, uh, you take your favorite uh, Hadamard matrix, and you wonder if the uh, uncertainty diagram would look like that or not. Okay, so that's uh, a. a, a so that's the first part of um, of the talk, really. Uh, the second part is very short, but um, uh, I will maybe not insist on this because uh, let me go to the word, one word I haven't used yet, which is non-classicality. So far, I didn't say anything about non-classicality. You have to define this thing. Remember, I have only two ingredients. I have a Hilbert space and two bases. And so I'm saying that Dirac and Kirkwood, Dirac is 1945, Kirkwood 1933, uh, uh, wrote this matrix down. So you just stare at it for 30 seconds. It's a matrix you construct with the ingredients we have. This is the, 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 the unitary tra uh, 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 transition matrix between the two bases. And these are the components of the vector psi on one of the bases and on the other base. And this is a matrix you can construct. It. Okay. And it has some nice properties. If you sum all the elements of the matrix, you get one. And if you take the marginal, meaning you sum over one row or one column, you get these, uh, these things. So this looks like a, a probability distribution, a joint probability distribution for uh, these two probability distributions I talked about on the first slide, except that it has the bad taste of taking complex values. So it has become customary to call this a quasi probability distribution. And now the definition is obvious. 
you call a state KD for Kirkwood Dirac classical if and only if its quasi distribution is real and non negative. So you don't have to know any quantum mechanics for this. Two ingredients, a Hilbert space, two bases. You write this down and you make this definition, and we're finished. Okay? Of course, you can ask, ask the question why is this interesting? And I can answer that one too. But let's just say that this is the natural thing to do. So, and, and of course, I wrote down here, non-classical is good for you, okay? It helps you build a better quantum mousetrap. Okay. So, um, let's see, what shall I say about this? Yeah, so, so the question is, given to these this bases A and B, are there such classical states? Maybe there aren't any. Well, if these two uh, bases are equal, then there certainly are. Because then all states are classical. That's not interesting. That's the completely compatible case. You don't want that. You want to look at cases where. Uh, so now, it, so here are some examples. These are the same examples as before, except that this time I, I uh, colored. The coloring now makes sense. The blue ones are non-classical. The red ones are classical. Okay. So these correspond to classical states. Classical states. There are some classical states here. There's some, and, and there are even points here where there can be both classical and non-classical states. So you have now an enriched diagram and you want to know, can you explain this structure? For example, why is there only uh, blue ones above this, uh, above this, this diagonal here? And where are all the classical states? So that's now the question. So, um, okay. So it's nice to have some answers. So here's a the theorem. If U has no zeros, I don't say U has to have a Hadamard matrix. If U has no zeros, then Psi's classical implies that it lies below that diagonal. Let's look at this. This is these U's, these U, these two U's have no zeros, and there are no classical states below that diagonal. So the theorem confirms this picture. Here there are classical states below that diagonal. There's plenty of them here. But this pin two uh, transition matrix, which is Wigner's little matrix, has zeros in it. Okay. Okay. Good. So this explains part of it. If you, in on, in on addition, in addition, if you is Hadamard, then psi, psi classical uh, implies uh, that either psi is a basis vector or it lies one one line below, not d plus one, but d. It lies, so it cannot lie on that diagonal. So we can see that here. Here, for example. Uh, uh, there are actually no other uh, classical ones, but uh, you see uh, there's these two up there and there's nobody below. Okay. So, so that's that these are two results. And so in particular, if you have um, a completely incompatible uh, U, which means that all the minors are non-vanishing, then all classical states have minimal uncertainty. If in addition it is Hadamard, the only classical states are the basis vector. Okay, so this is if you agree that it may be of interest to understand when this matrix is has only positive entries, you agree on that, then it is interesting to check this out. And so I have some results here that start to explain it. Okay, but of course there is an infinite of uh, uh, infinite number of questions one can ask. Uh, here is, oops, no, that's too quick. I will thank you when it's time to thank you, but let's uh, go back here. Uh, do I have still a minute or two? Oh, good, great. So, okay, so, so questions and some guesses. Here, here are some other pictures. This picture you haven't seen yet. This is the discrete Fourier transform in the dimension six. Uh, let's first look at it without looking at the coloring. The, the, the uncertainty diagram looks like this. There is a hole in it, for example, at three three. Okay, well you can check that. There is no no states which have, have support three three. And there is points here with two three and three two. These are the ones everyone has to construct, uh, and they are classical because they are red. Okay. This is a discrete for Fourier transform in dimension seven. That's uh, basically uh, the result. The shape of the diagram is the result of uh, of tau. And, and what I proved on the previous slide is that indeed the only uh, classical states are the basis vectors which are here and there. Why do, why do I say these are the basis vectors? Because here the NA support is one. That means you have a basis vector. 
and the and B support is everywhere. So that's a basis vector, and that's a basis vector in the other direction. And these are the only classical ones. So uh, uh, and then uh, this is the DFT in dimension four, which uh, well is very much like the one next door with the six the six one, right? So here's a question. You can observe on these three examples that the classical states all lie on the line N or on the hyperbola N A and B equal D, which is this hyperbola. So this is true in dimension two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay. And I don't know if it is true beyond. In other words, I don't know if it is true if you go to dimension 28, that perhaps in this belly here, there are some points that are red. No, no, but, but seven is a good example because it's the tau theorem. It, it's, it's completely incompatible. But the curve does not coincide, it's much lower. Yes, but it does in all these things. That's, that's because I, I take, that this is true for all MUBs. For MUBs, this curve will always coincide with that line at the end point. Yes, okay, so these are good examples for exactly the question I'm asking. But it could have been that these things here on that line were red too, but I ruled that out with the theorem uh, the page before, which is which wasn't clear before that. Okay, so the, the theorem I, I quickly zips by, I admit this went a little fast. This theorem says. If it is in addition, Hadamard, the only classical states are basic vectors, which is indeed what you see here. But the priori, this wasn't clear. Uh, uh, so uh, again, I come to dimension, what did I say, 48? There could be many points in this belly here, some of which, some of which could be blue and some of which could be red. And some of which could not be there, like this one, 3, 3 is not there. And, and I don't know. And I suspect that it will take some number theory to do this. And the reason I suspect that is that to prove this, it takes some number theory, which Tao did. And it's beyond my capacities, although it is reportedly very simple number theory. But one doesn't exclude the other. Uh, so, uh, so I think there may be something that can be done here without too much effort uh, if somebody finds it interesting. So, um, so this was this question here. And of course, you can go one step further and ask if this is true for all MUBs, which of course is completely, I mean, you know, all MUBs means all complex Hadamard. Yes, yes. You take all, uh, uh, and is it always true that, that the only classical states lie on that uh, hyperbola? And which, of course, as you mentioned, touches the, the, the straight line. These are always there. So these are the basis states that are always uh, classical. And the question is, uh, is there the only possible ones? This is, of course, impossibly difficult because I think it's impossibly difficult, probably, because we don't have a handle on the MUB. Okay, so this is that. So I think I'm at the end, basically. Uh, these are the take home questions summed up. You only need a Hilbert space and two orthonormal bases with its associated transition matrix. And you can ask these questions. First question is what does their uncertainty diagram look like? which is already a non-trivial question. We've seen some examples when this thing can have holes in it. And the lower edge is not necessarily simple. It may have a very jagged uh, form. So if you take a high dimension, it may look, in, it may look funny. Okay, and, and, and so this is not such an easy question. It's solved, uh, I solved it in some cases, but it's, it's in general not an easy question. So yes, and then, uh, the next question is, once you have figured out what this uncertainty diagram looks like, you, and, and if you're still interested, you can say, well, what about non-classicality? Which states are non-classical? And you can wonder about that, which states are non-classical? And then you can say, well, okay, I'm only interested in Hadamard matrices. So I, I, th then I have a little more information. Uh, is it true that all classical states obey this, which was the question I had on the previous page? Okay. So I, I think I can wrap it up there uh, and, and now properly thank you.